Hello and warm uh, wishes to everyone joining the session uh, by Ulf titled Amnesia Rocks DB2 Amnesia Backend Plugin on Steroids. We're glad, Ulf, that you could join us today. And uh, without any further ado, over to you, Ulf. Now, let me. Yes. Hello. My name is Ulf Weger. I've been around in the Erlang community for um, quite some time now. Uh, joined Ericsson in 96. At that time, I had been playing with Erlang for about four years. Um, so, and I've been doing a lot of work over the years in and around Nisia. Um, now, since 2017, I work with uh, um, blockchain, the Eternity Foundation. And uh, we have been using Nisia in that blockchain uh, project and have uh, made some developments that I would like to share with you now. So I guess most people are acquainted with Nisia, or at least they know of it, since it comes with uh, OTP, and it has since the beginning. And it really was initially intended to be like an extension of the Erlang language. And um, so the, the core language essentially giving you processes. And actually, initially, you would have, um, <clears throat> when I came across Erlang for the first time in 92, there was no standard library. There actually wasn't even distribution. Um, if you wanted a database functionality, you had to build it yourself, which I spent some time doing. It was fun, but not very productive. Um, the uh, computer science lab team started playing with how to do database programming in, in Erlang. And one of the things they added very early was Erlang term storage, which you could see as a form of a database in Erlang. And you've all used them. They're sort of ad hoc hash tables or trees. Initially, it was only hash tables. Um, that you can just create. You can have thousands of them. And uh, when the owning process dies, the ETS tables are cleared away. One of the core features of them is that the data in an ETS table is not garbage collected. And this was initially for performance reasons. In the mid 90s, we didn't have very fast computers. Um, so, and also not generational garbage collection. So keeping your data in the process heap ended up being very expensive, not least in terms of garbage collection. So Amnesia um, was initially called Amnesia because it was just an in-memory database. So it was kind of cute when you uh, stopped it, it lost its memory, thereby Amnesia. Some boss at Ericsson didn't think that was an acceptable name for a database. So then they dropped the A and called it Nisia, which essentially means memory in Greek. Um, the disk storage was more or less an afterthought because, well, for telecoms applications, you did also need to be able to back up memory on disk. And um, so the, you could say that the core way to do persistence in Nisia is to have the data in ETS tables, which are then streamed to disk using disk log. Uh, I'll mention that a little bit more later. And it's actually quite robust and efficient. Now, Nisia was a distributed database management system long before there really were any commercial uh, options for that. I think um, Klaus Wikström and Hans Nilsson wrote a poster about that back in 1995. Actually, this was before the first version of OTP. Um, so <clears throat> there are some amazing aspects of Nisia, not least that it was also initially made so that you could subvert it. 
um, it has transaction support, so you can get ACID properties. But if you really want to get to the data as quickly as possible, you have dirty reads, you have dirty writes, you can even do it even more lightweight than, than dirty reads and do essentially ETS reads, which is very minimal overhead uh, compared to using the ETS API. And this was intentional and, and sort of in line with Nisia being sort of at the fingertips of the programmer all the time. I mentioned there that the impedance mismatch is low. Impedance mismatch is essentially what you get if, say, you have a, an SQL database. They are wonderful in their own right, but you essentially have a different language. You have different data representations. So you have to essentially work in two different environments and um, possibly also do heavy context switching in, in the OS in order to get to the data. And this is what is typically called an impedance mismatch. And Nisia was designed to minimize this impedance mismatch. So essentially, you're just coding Erlang and the database keeps Erlang terms, and that's the way you like it, typically. Um, now, there are some bad things as well. Uh, one thing is that the persistent storage was essentially an afterthought. Um, the disk uh, only copies, as you they're called in Nisia, are using a library called DETS. And DETS essentially has the same semantics as ETS, except it's on disk. But this really is not a very good idea um, because ETS, since it runs in the same memory space and it's in full, under full control of the VM, you can guarantee that an insert actually works. If it doesn't work, that you're probably running out of memory or something and, and worse things are gonna happen. But when you try to write something on disk, uh, a lot of stuff can go wrong. And um, Nisia really is not designed to handle errors in debts accesses. Um, so that's one problem. The other problem is that debts still uses a 32-bit bucket system, and it can only handle two gigabytes of data. And so in the mid 90s, maybe that felt like a lot, but nowadays it feels very silly because if you only have two gigabytes of data in a table, you might as well have it in RAM. Um, so what people do for persistence usually in Nisa is they use disk copies. And um, disk copies are essentially checkpointed ETS. As I said, the big problem with them is that they're limited by the amount of RAM because all your data resides in RAM and is logged to disk. It's fast, it's robust, it's very reliable, but it limits the size of your database or at least of individual tables. Um, another problem with Nisia is that the table sync is pretty naive. And I think part of that was, it was intended to be used in a cluster application with all the data in memory, so the memory, the tables wouldn't be that large. So essentially you would figure out who had the freshest copy and then you would copy the entire table over when you synced. For very large data sets, this will not be acceptable. Uh, another thing is that if you run distributed databases, and I, my interpretation, I don't know if I'm alone in this, but I've seen a lot of complaints about how badly Nisia handles certain error situations in distributed database um, applications. Um, but one observation I 
have often made is that it's so easy to set up a distributed database using Mesia that people do it without really thinking of it as hard. But there are some very hard failure scenarios. And in some cases, people have sort of run a, an Erlang cluster with several replicas of every Mesia table, and then they run into split brain or something like that, and things go badly. Uh, they get annoyed and they throw out Mesia and they use an, um, especially some years ago, a Postgres copy that was not replicated at all. And if that was good enough, then you didn't have to replicate using Mesia either. But Mesia doesn't really give you much guidance in how to avoid nasty failure scenarios with distributed processing. Um, if you work at it and you look at presentations and stuff, you can, you can find pointers on how to fix it. And uh, it is possible to achieve pretty good robustness there, but a lot of it is, it is undocumented and relying on third-party projects. So I would say that this is a little bit bad, at least in that it sort of allows you to do it, but it, it pretends that it's a lot easier than it actually is. So the really ugly, the disk only copies, they are essentially un, unusable. You should stay away from them. And the biggest problem is if you approach the two gigabyte limit, not only may performance suffer, um, it used to when disk caches were smaller because that's is very sensitive to, to caching. Um, but if you grow beyond the addressable limit in debts, it will basically tell Mesia that, no, I couldn't write that. Uh, but Mesia doesn't care. It actually ignores that. So you will get silent data loss. And this is, this is evil. It just, so the, the, um, the advice is stay away from disk only copies. Um, but of course, this means that for practical purposes, you're bounded with the, by the amount of available RAM on your node or possibly in your uh, cluster if you wanna get fancy with, with uh, the distribution aspects. And it's one thing I've been trying to address for many years is I, while Mesia is great in getting started and doing prototyping and you can very easily create a database that's extremely easy to, to work with, you don't want there to be sort of hard boundaries where you simply cannot go any further or you go past that line and suddenly every, everything becomes extremely difficult because users who believe that they may need to go there um, will forego Mnesia entirely and use something else just so that they will avoid this trauma later on. So back in 2016, I was uh, working on a backend uh, plugin interface. And uh, Klarna got interested in this. I'll talk a little bit more about Klarna. So they hired me, I was at Erlang Solutions at the time, to make this into product quality. And it actually became part of Nisia and uh, as of OTP 19 in 2016. But it's pretty much undocumented. So you may have missed this. I wouldn't fault you if you have. Um, there are a couple of plugins that are out there on GitHub. There is um, a level DB plugin, which um, Klarna uses. Um, it has the drawback that it relies on Basho's um, level DB uh, interface. And of course, Basho is no longer, so I don't think that is very well maintained. Level Ed is a key value store that is used um, 
in React. It's all Erlang, which is nice. And there is a back Amnesia backend plugin for using Levelhead. Uh, we at Eternity uh, use RocksDB. Uh, Benoit Chesnon uh, maintains a RocksDB interface uh, for Erlang, and we're using that and, uh, and the RocksDB plugin. There is also an experimental Postgres plugin. That was something I did while working with Klarna, and that was mainly to see how well Postgres performed as a backend plugin, which is essentially using Postgres as a key value store. And well, I guess it did surprisingly well, but not as well as level DB. Um, another thing that was introduced at this time, I'm, I'm just gonna mention it because it's also undocumented, but I think it's pretty cool. And uh, it's there in the documentation for Amnesia RocksDB. I have some, I write some more about this and the plugin support since it is undocumented in OTP. Index plugins allows you to register a callback function that you can then use in indexes and it will be served the full object and it is expected to return index, index values. So essentially any index values that you can derive from the object can be used as an index in Nisia. And uh, so this I think is a very powerful feature that is a well-kept secret. So the way you would use um, a backend plugin I have a short example here. You create Amnesia schema, you start Amnesia, and then you can add a backend type uh, where you provide an alias. An alias would be at the level of, for example, disk copies, RAM copies. Here we call it RocksDB copies. And then a callback module, which would be Amnesia RocksDB. Then you can create a table where you name, uh, you provide, the types of table, and in this case, you use the RocksDB copies alias on the local node. And then you can start using that just as any other Mnesia table. And all the Mnesia functionality works just like it normally does. A caveat is you wouldn't want to use RocksDB or LevelDB or mostly any plugin, I think, for bag tables, because they're quite difficult to implement in, uh, in most key value stores. So if you want to use bag tables, use RAM or disk copies. So for example, Klarna is using the level DB uh, backend. They have... Uh, it's probably a lot bigger now, but some years ago, around 2016, when they switched to level DB, they had more than 600 gigabytes in their Mnesia database. They were using RAM, uh, it should actually be disk copies mostly. Um, so they had to keep it all in, in RAM. They were using DET for some things, disk only copies, but trying to get away from it. Um, in order to make this work, they had monster machines with, I think, two terabytes of RAM or something. Um, and one of the things that they were concerned uh, with was that when you have 600 gig gigabytes of data in uh, that is essentially RAM resident, even if it's on disk, it has to be loaded into RAM every time you restart. So restarting took half an hour. Just loading the database was like 20 minutes of that. Um, so one of the things they were after for moving to level DB was much faster startup time, which they also got. And of course, over time, much lower RAM usage meant that they didn't have to buy these ridiculously expensive Dell blades with two terabytes of RAM which is also a good thing. Um, 
Now for these very large data sets, they did not use the naive Nisia replication protocol. They used their own replication protocol. Um, I'm not gonna talk much about this, but there are some callbacks in the plugin interface that would allow you to write a custom replication protocol as part of a backend plugin. It's only been tested in toy examples. So, but if any of you wanna try that, hey, uh, that would be interesting to get feedback on. So Eternity blockchain, the thing about blockchains is that they are certainly distributed systems. They're essentially untrusted peer-to-peer -peer networks. But at the node level, they're not distributed. So we're not using Erlang distribution at all. Uh, so we have a database that's like 140 gigabytes, um, but it's all sync. You essentially start, you can start an empty node and get the entire database from the network. Uh, it's faster to download a snapshot and start from that. But well, that's the nature of the application. So essentially we don't care about replication. We do care about persistence, um, but in this particular database application, we don't worry about replication at all at the database level. One problem that blockchains tend to have um, is write pressure especially if they are blockchains of the style of Eternity or Ethereum, where you allow smart contracts because you have a very sizable blockchain state and you can end up with um, essentially easily saturating the IO system. But the access patterns are simple. You don't, we don't have any relational queries or anything like that. We have one index, I think. So we've been using RocksDB. It's been working very well. We also have configuration support so you can use other plugin plugins. For example, LevelEd, we could we actually test that as well. And it's possible to use that if you want to on your blockchain node. And uh, we can also use it RAM only for testing uh, to speed things up. So the thing about write pressure ended up being a um, nasty corner case for us because especially during sync, we write data as fast as we possibly can to the database. And then in some cases, for example, in uh, running a Docker image on a virtual uh, machine in the cloud, the IO system can get saturated and then you can get write stalls in RocksDB. This can also happen in LevelDB and typically mostly any key value store. Um, and um, what it can do is that you can configure how it handles this. Um, the default is that it just returns an error, but just like with the debts problem that we talked about before, Nisia doesn't care. So then you get database inconsistency. Uh, you can also have it block, which we've tried. It doesn't work in our system. Then it also has support for pushback so that you can slow down writes. But for various reasons, that was also difficult to deal with in a backend plugin scenario. And um, part of this is that this whole backend plugin system was an afterthought in Amnesia. And there are limits to what you can do. Uh, without a major redesign of the system. So the point of no return, just to clarify, this is when you commit a transaction, for example, Nisia writes to the transaction log, which in database terms is a write ahead log uh, or a wall. And once it has done that, uh, it can, Essentially, it knows that it can recover that transaction. And then it writes to the data stores. Or if you have a dirty write, it goes directly to the data stores. But the, the API that it uses is essentially after, at that point, it just assumes that everything will work 
and again, this is sort of the Etz heritage, and uh, it's very hard to deal with. Um, we also have sort of a file descriptor problem because these log based log merge key value stores use a lot of file descriptors. And in the first version of Nisia level DB and Nisia rocks DB, we had one database instance per table and we could end up with thousands of file descriptors open, which probably makes the write pressure problem harder. Um, now RocksDB has added something called column families, which are essentially lo logical tables that you can use within one database instance. So we wanted to use that and map Nisia tables to column families and just keep one RocksDB instance for an alias in the Nisia uh, world. And uh, this could lessen the, the write pressure problem, we hoped, the file descriptor problem. And we also wanted to add more tables and this, we didn't want, we wanted to do this first. So we've been working on this. But RocksDB has other things that are interesting. For example, they have their own transactions. They're a bit quirky, but they're essentially optimistic transactions and they're quite fast. You can also do batch updates where you have a list of updates that either um, are written atomically or not at all. And it's also much faster to use batches than to do multiple individual writes, for example. You can also check out a snapshot, which is, since it's a, essentially a log-based system, just like you can do with uh, immutable data structures, that if you keep a reference to the old version uh, of a data structure, then essentially that is a consistent view of the past. And uh, in RocksDB and LevelDB, you can use this to efficiently um, iterate over a consistent snapshot of the database. So we're using that, for example, in selects and everything. And um, if we're using column families, then we can actually achieve atomicity in transactions and batch, batch updates across tables. And when you look at this set of features, you're kind of getting close to what Nisia gives you overall. But RocksDB is much more low level and um, not quite as user-friendly as, uh, as Nisia is. But the idea that we wanted to explore was, okay, let's keep using Nisia and uh, we create the tables in Nisia uh, and uh, still maintain the compatibility. So if you use the Nisia APIs, then you have everything, transaction support, replication, and everything. But if you want to step down to a lower level, you, you should be able to use the RocksDB API directly, but in a way that is slightly adapted to the way you're used to working in Nisia. So an example. We create, uh, we start Nisia. Um, I had created a table T before, and I have now an MRDB uh, API, which can take a table name, Nisia table name, quickly find the metadata and read it using the direct RocksDB API. The MRDB insert works like Nisia dirty write, uh, MRDB select works as Nisia select, essentially. I also have an MRDB activity where I can start a transaction. I need to name the alias because that is one, uh, that would be my sort of scope within which I can commit atomically. And then I provide a fund just like when I do a Nisia transaction. And then I can use the, the MRDB API for reading and in reading and writing. And this works. And it works very similarly to Mnesia. And the idea is if, if you get into the performance realm where Mnesia might start uh, acting funny with uh, the backend plugin, the, the problems I've uh, mentioned before, this could be a way to take control of it. So the batches, um, 
can be used similarly. You can also use that in the, the activity um, the activity function, you can provide a batch here and then a fun, and the fun will work not in a transaction transaction context, but it will be committed, uh, it will be written atomically as a whole to the database. And in the as batch function, you provide a table name, and then the fun provides takes a reference, which is a map that has metadata for the table. And in this case, an annotated map that also has a batch reference. And then MRDB, the other functions will sense this and they will use the appropriate functions in RocksDB. Um, now, MRDB also detects Mesia indexes and will actually update them accordingly. So even if you use the direct RocksDB interface, it will be consistent, ma consistently maintain Mnesia indexes. So, and also the indexes are actually RocksDB tables. Here I'm using the function get ref for uh, the table I, which I created that without telling you, that has an index. It has metadata in a map here. I can see what the alias is. I have the RocksDB handles for the column family, the database. Also encoding, I can tweak the encoding. For example, if I know that I have binary data and binary values, then I don't have to do Erlang term encoding or sext encoding, which is essentially Erlang term encoding that maintains the sorting properties, which is what you would use for ordered sets. So you can choose this to optimize the space utilization in your database. The properties uh, submap is all the Mnesia me metadata. Uh, so you can actually fetch the indexes and then there is a naming convention that allows you to access the indexes as Mnesia tables and um, which can open up some interesting uh, functionality like you can fold you can um, iterate over an um, an erlang table in index order or reverse index order perhaps um, so it will allow you a little bit more flexibility than the nisia does now one thing that we're making use of is persistent terms that came uh, were introduced in otp21 that allows us to access lots of metadata for the tables extremely quickly. Um, now, persistent terms are expensive to update, but lightning fast to read. Um, but creating tables, modifying table metadata happens very seldomly. So it's actually perfect for this scenario. So, Looking at performance, because if this weren't fast, then there wasn't, wouldn't really be a point to it. I performed some silly benchmarks where I just created a table for each interesting category. I filled it with 5,000 objects. I iterated over the objects, and then I ran a, an iteration where I created a transaction where I read an object, modified it, and then read it back. So. And um, to the left, we see RAM copies. And of course, they are extremely fast um, to update. They're extreme, even faster to read. Transaction support, well, it does locking and all kinds of stuff. So it's a bit slow, even for RAM copies. Disk copies are only slightly slower than RAM copies for uh, filling or doing lots of writes, it's as fast as RAM copies for reads, and it's slightly more expensive for transactions because it actually has to log the transaction on disk um, in the commit. Um, Disk-only copies in the middle there, as we can see, they suck overall. 
not only do they have the hard size limit, they are slow on writes, they are slow on reads, and very slow on transactions. Now, the RocksDB copies column, that is using the Mnesia API on a RocksDB table, as I showed you initially. It's faster than disk-only copies on writes, much faster on reads, and also faster on transactions, which is kind of funny, but I think it has to do with uh, that the access patterns are more efficient than I was actually using two reads and one write inside the transaction. But MRDB does the same thing, but only calling the MRDB API and using the optimistic RocksDB transactions. And uh, it's actually approaching RAM copies and disk copies, actually slightly better on writes uh, than disk copies and better than all of them on transactions. So this does achieve the goal of boosting performance if we have to, while keeping all the data out of RAM. Well, it uses memory map tables, but essentially it's, it's disk only, um, plus memory caching, of course. And um, so you can have hundreds of gigabytes of data that you can access very quickly. And this allows us also to um, access some pretty extreme performance on very large data sets that was previously not available uh, in Mnesia. So hopefully this will sort of extend the, the reach of Mnesia or the, the number of problems and the number of configurations where you can keep using Mnesia and um, without sacrificing uh, the initial goodness of it. So <clears throat> things to think about, but this is in line with the Mnesia mentality that if you're using the MRDB transactions, um, they won't, play that nicely with Nisia transactions um, or mostly the other way around. Nisia transactions will think that they are offer atomicity, but once you're committed, they um, are not necessarily as atomic on the actual update side. I think I'm fixing that, but it, it used to be difficult since we had multiple instances, one instance per table. If we have everything as column families, then this will be better, but Nisia RocksDB can't guarantee that for backward compatibility reasons. This becomes a big problem for us. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, the way RocksDB optimistic transaction works uh, transactions work is that they essentially take a pre-image and they allow you to update data. And then at commit time, they compare the commit set with the pre-image. And if the data has in the database has moved, anything in the commit set has shifted since the pre-image, it will abort the transaction. This is less fine granular than the Mnesia transactions. But if you have a carefully considered access pattern, which you can often have in Erlang, because you have such good control over the concurrency, then this may not be an issue. We think that it's not an issue for us. So we'd rather take the performance. Now, one thing I found to my absolute horror was that if you have concurrent RocksDB transactions and one transaction writes some data, that actually pops up in the other transactions, which I consider violating the isolation property of transactions. But there is a way to fix that by marrying RocksDB transactions and RocksDB snapshots, which are very lightweight. So in MRDB, I actually use both so that when you're in a transaction, you have a consistent view of the data you read. So if you read it, a piece of data once, um, 
you will see that again, or possibly the data you wrote in your transaction to modify it, not something that some other transaction is writing. Now, if some other transaction is writing to the same data you are, chances are one of you will, or you will abort. Um, now, MRDB then takes a mutex and reruns the transaction, refreshing the pre-image and possibly then passing. And that seems to work pretty well. So the transactions in MRDB are a lot nicer to deal with than the RocksDB transactions. But if you want to use the rocks, raw RocksDB transactions, you can use the yes, MRDB yeah. API. So I'm pretty much done, actually. Um, that is the repository. I would have liked to uh, have a release tag ready for you, but I'm still working on a PR. Hopefully I will merge that this week. But if you wanna dive into this right away, you can contact me and um, we'll make sure that you, you know where to find the latest stuff and, and uh, know what the exact status is. Okay, so I see that there is a question. When we would choose this Mesia DB over various other external DBs, uh, does Mesia DB support other domains rather than Erlang, or is it just for building fast telecommunications applications? Well, um, it's not just for telecom, obviously. Um, it's possible that using rocks to be this way and using rocks to be transactions, you could coexist with other applications using the same rocks to be instance. I haven't tried that. I don't know what the what the complexities would be since rocks to be runs essentially as a NIF in Erlang. Um, but generally, the Mnesia Nisia does is Erlang local and supports your local application. So I think this mainly allows you to reach further with Nisia than you could previously, but perhaps not uh, address fundamentally different use cases. So if you want other applications to access data in Mesia, you probably still have to, you still have to provide an access API uh, to it that you maintain. I think we've come to uh, the end of our time here.